This is Greg Pass with the Americans in Wartime Experience. Today's date is July the 29th, 2022. I'm in Woodbridge, Virginia, and I have the pleasure to sit down with Phil Milio through the magic of Zoom. Phil, tell us where you are today. I'm in the middle of Manhattan, uh, right near Central Park in New York City. Outstanding. So what is your full name and where were you born? Um, my full name is Philip Joseph Milio, and I was born in New York City. And you have any military veterans in your family? Yeah, um, my brother was uh, was in the Air Force. As a matter of fact, that was some of my motivation to join. Back in the time when I was 18 uh, or younger, whenever the, the draft was in place. So it was uh, it's going to happen one way or another to serve in, in the, our country. And I chose to join. And he was in the Air Force. I thought about joining the Air Force, but I was too young when I graduated high school. So my folks said no. But then about eight or nine months later, they said yes, because I was promised a school. And uh, I said, yeah, well, if I join now, I'll get the school I want. So, so that, that so was, US Army, you went with the US Army? I went with the US Army. I was sent to um, uh, photography signal school in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey after basic training. So you didn't have to go too far then? No. Nah. Well, first I started off in Fort Benning for basic. Gotcha. So that was a discovery. This is further south I had ever been in my life. Uh huh. So that was that was it was exciting, hearing different accents, um, meeting people from who lived and worked on farms to urban folks like myself or suburban. Tell, tell us a little bit about your MOS and what kind of training went into that. Uh, my MOS was about. Um, uh, taking photographs, developing photographs, learning how to use different types of cameras in those days. And that was in 1967 when I went through training. So we had to learn what was uh, in stock in the inventory for the military. Um, 35 millimeter cameras were still uh, very expensive and had very few of those around. And so they taught us how to use a speed graphic if you ever saw Jimmy Olsen and Superman taking a big a picture with a flash that pop and keep changing the bulb every time you take a picture and use four by five negatives. I learned how to use that quite well. Actually, it was it was good training and they taught us how to develop photographs. And then in turn, we learned how to do portraits. How do you do lighting? Uh, and then also to be able to take photographs in the field, of course. So. so I I, I, I'm not a photographer, but I, I stand in amazement sometimes. I see these guys with these huge, you know, lenses, and it looks like there's a lot of science and, and art that goes into that. I imagine that's a totally different level in combat photography. I mean, you're in the middle of of nasty environments, in some cases, getting shot at, and you're still trying to take pictures. What 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 do they teach you how to how to balance that? Well, uh, we didn't have that kind of equipment in those days um, uh, that we had access to. Uh, we had shorter lenses. And we would photograph sometimes uh, aerial photographs from a, a small single engine prop plane or a helicopter. And that you have to deal with the vibration. So I'd have to use a high speed on the, and it was film. So we didn't know what the picture looked like, not like today where you can instantly look at what the photograph looks like. And if you didn't like it, take another. So we had to wait until we get back to our base of operations, develop the film, make the prints, uh, so that would be a big process. Uh, I also worked when I was in Vietnam, I worked with um, uh, image interpreters and they needed to have film developed a certain way to make sure that they can see the imagery of where uh, uh, reconnaissance was, was taking place and then the after, after action reports to photograph that. Uh, not only did I do some uh, photography from the sky, but also we had Air Force shooting film, large nine inch rolls of film. And we would develop those and make prints from that. And the imagery was uh, put together to make three dimensional images so that the image interpreter and analysts in the intelligence unit I worked with in, in Vietnam would be able to see, measure the depth of, 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 of uh, structures of any kind or be able to tell if, uh, it was camouflage or chopped up, you know, uh, jungle rather than natural jungle. So you can determine whether or not they were camouflaging trucks or 
heavy weaponry or whatever, or themselves. Uh, also uh, to measure and figure out how deep something is, if they were going to send uh, ground troops in. So there's a lot to the image interpretation, and we had to be able to make sure the photographs are, were of a very high quality. Pretty difficult in those days under those the conditions of working in a very warm place. So uh, it was it was very challenging, but it was also very exciting. Yeah. So so the so the photography then is more more uh, for intelligence gathering than from, from what I alluded to earlier, where you're actually taking photographs of of, of the field itself, like. Um, like um, what was his name? The guy in D-Day, uh, Kappa, was it? The oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's more the intelligence side of photography. Yeah. Gotcha. Yes, yes, yes. Now, uh, are those also... different? Are those different schools, or is it the same school? Do all photographers go through the same school, or is there like a combat photography and an intelligence photography that different animal? Uh, for someone who was specifically going to go in the field, like Robert Capper or whoever, uh, they learned some other techniques because they're going to be working with the infantry usually, yeah, yeah. Uh, or they're going to work with a, a ground reconnaissance group of some sort. So they had to be able to handle being in their combat conditions immediately at any time. We, If we were flying, of course, we had to deal with somebody shooting at us in the sky. Uh, it wasn't as, as It wasn't the same as somebody who was always on the ground. Gotcha. Some of our, uh, some of those uh, people who, or soldiers who went through the training I went through, it depends on where they were assigned. Some of them were sent to a ground ground unit and had to go on patrols. So it, they learned on the job, mm -hmm. how, to, how to handle the, uh, the situation. So, so you, gra you graduate from, uh, from your AIT, your advanced schooling, and then you're off to Europe, is that right? Yes, I went to uh, the 97th Signal Corps, and um, it was in uh, part of the 7th Army in Mannheim, Germany. And there I was doing a lot of standard photographs. It was more photojournalistic or portraits, portraits of officers, portraits of uh, a soldier of the week, a soldier of the month, that kind of stuff that would be published in a newsletter of some sort, uh, also documenting uh, the troops uh, out in the field. So I did do some field photography uh, and, and was different weather. It was snow on the ground and dealing with field unit um, equipment, how to, how to handle uh, all the equipment and be able to develop inside of a van, which was on the back of a deuce and a half truck. And we'd go in there and develop our film and come back out with a print as fast as you possibly can. So somebody might uh, use it for whatever, whatever they need it for. So that was a kind of uh, a very broad type of ph photography that we did. Uh, it was uh, not for anything specific other than to uh, maintain records of what events, or if we had field training, there'd be a record of that. Uh, sometimes, we, since I was in a signal unit, sometimes we'd be photographing um, soldiers climbing, uh, putting up poles and putting out um, uh, wires for, field communications through uh, walkie talkies or whatever gotcha. or field field phones. So how long were you in um, in Europe before you got marching orders to head to Vietnam? I was in I was in Germany for six months uh, and uh, it was in uh, from about February to September and around August I think it was the um, Soviets had a had a moved into Czechoslovakia and uh, caused a bit of a disturbance and we were on alert for quite a while. So what, um, that's when I said, I think I could do better by serving my country in Vietnam. And I put in a, what was called the 1049 transfer to Vietnam. And I, I got that rather quickly. Um, and uh, they, uh, so I got home, went home on a 30 day leave in September and October 5th, 1968, I was in, on my way to Vietnam. Okay, so let's talk about that. So, um, your family, when they found out that that you had um, requested to go to Vietnam and that you were, that was actually going to happen, what what kind of conversations came <laughs> came out? <of> that? <laughs> um, well, they didn't know. They won't know maybe even until they hear this <laughs> uh, that I volunteered. Um, they were happy that I was safe in in germany yeah I bet. um uh, but uh i i just felt it was my responsibility to do what i can for my country uh with what i was trained to do and who knows what but so uh 
No, they were certainly not thrilled <laughs> that I was going to Vietnam. And um, the, the country was also in starting to have more mixed uh, feelings. Uh, the Tet of 68, which was the big Tet, there's Tet every year, but the in 68, the big Tet happened. And so uh, there was a lot of questioning going on in the United States about, well, what are we doing there? Um, uh, but I, that actually happened right about the same time I went to Germany um, in February of 68. So um, my, my family was very supportive of me and wanted to make sure that I was going to be okay and give me your address when we get there. We'll send you cookies, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so how'd you get there? So I had to fly to Seattle, Washington, and that's where I, uh, on civilian flight, and then I went from there, I was there less than 24 hours, and uh, what was it was beautiful out outside my barracks window was Mount Rainier with the snow on top. It was kind of a pleasant, calm moment. And then uh, we flew from Seattle to um, uh, Honolulu to refuel, and then from Honolulu, Hawaii to Manila in the Philippines to refuel, and then we flew from Manila to Cameron Bay in Vietnam. And that's where I landed. That's when I was in country. Well, your first impressions when you got off the plane about as concerned as it concerns the weather and just the environment in general. Well, stepping off, well, stepping off the plane, going down the steps, because we, we, it, it's not like an airport here in, in, in New York city, like JFK or anything like that. You walk, you have to walk down on the tarmac and poo, the heat and humidity just, it, it's kind of a, a reverse stun. It was just, it's overwhelming. And then <laughs> sweat stains forming on everybody as we had to, we had to line up. And that was when we saw caskets going into another plane nearby. And everyone was silent, stood. We were a, a bit of a distance. Um, and we were just told to uh, wait until they were all, all the caskets were on that uh, airplane. I, I can't quite remember. I just was, I remember seeing the caskets. I don't remember what kind of plane, but it looked like a cargo plane. And so how old was, were you? I was 19. So what's going through a 19 year old kid's mind when you, you know, when you land in a foreign country and one of the first thing you see is American soldiers being, being sent home in, in caskets, what goes on in a, 19 year old kid's mind when you see something like that the the little i can remember about that moment was mostly i was overwhelmed by um how solemn that moment was because all of the troops i was with were dead silent we didn't even have to be told to to keep quiet we all just looked and watched um in sort of a parade fashion and um i just took it in as okay, I better keep my act together and make sure I do everything I can to help myself and my buddies wherever I wind up. So, where so we, were, we were there for, I was there for, uh, I think, less than 24 hours because it was daytime when I arrived and then uh, had to go to some sort of a, a transitory camp on, on uh, 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 tents. They were all tents with cots in uh, Cameron Bay and I they just said wait until we call your name just you know everybody will go to chow at the same time then come back come back to your bunk so it was then dark I, I think it was like 10 or 11 o'clock at night I, I really don't remember I know it was really dark um when we boarded um I believe it was a c-123 uh, or c-124 um air force cargo plane and we you know webbing and you all know, sit on the sides and they're very noisy and uh with our baggage and then i flew from there to um saigon Tansanut, where the headquarters was of the unit i got stationed in but a little bit before that if i can give you another picture just flashed through my head was the first time i had seen so many people with silk pants and black silk pants and conical hats. Um, there were 
uh, the, the local people, the Vietnamese people seeing so many on that base. So I was a little surprised, like, who are they? I started to get a little tense, like, well, who is that? Now I know enough that you, you knew that there could be a, a bad guy in there um, uh, infiltrating somehow as a cleaning person or a, a worker, because a, a lot of local people were hired to do some of the uh, tasks of, of cleaning or helping in the chow hall or whatever. So I, I started staring at them watching every move they made. And then I looked, I'd look in the distance and there were mountains around uh, and I'd see smoke here, smoke there, just wondering what's that smoke and why is that smoke there? Wonder what's going on. Uh, so there was a lot of wonderment and curiosity. Uh, and then troops, American troops, just doing their business, driving around. And it was the first time I had seen so many troops armed. I hadn't been armed yet. But just to see all these troops armed, they were either some sidearm or a rifle of some sort slung over their shoulder. It was like, okay, this is real. Uh, when am I going to get my rifle? Yeah. <laughs> you know, when am I going to get something? Um, so then, uh, th that that's a picture that was in my head um, that I that I can I could just close my eyes and I could see that little movie play again. Yeah. Then when I got to um, Tansunut, uh, uh, I guess headquarters knew I was coming. Uh, I had to report to a little desk there, and then they said you you have a, a a driver coming to pick you up. So there was a driver and an, a and somebody riding shotgun with them, and they picked me up in a jeep, or I think it was a jeep, and then they took me to our headquarters, which was in Saigon. Um, an address or anything like that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. It was another, um, um, it was like a dormitory type building. I think it might have been a hotel at one time at uh, the United States government was renting while we were there. So and what, so I stayed there what, for- What a unit were you assigned to then in, in uh, Saigon? Uh, so it, then, I, uh, then I discovered what it was that I was in the first military intelligence battalion and that was headquarters company. And I had to wait a couple of days uh, for a ride to go to Benoit, which is about 20 miles or so, 20, 30 miles away. Um, so somebody from Detachment A of First Military Intelligence Battalion came to pick me up. And then we, uh, a few days later, and then we drove to um, Benoit to my detachment uh, quarters, which was um, in, um, it was right next to the Dong Nai river or the song dong nai uh it was an old sawmill and the, so uh our our unit was in this old sawmill so on one side was the road in in the in town and on the other side was the river and we were guarded on the outside by vietnamese river boats and um army army our army infantry uh at a bridge nearby it was like about a uh, hundred meters away. So the um, the military intelligence battalion is that an independent unit or is it assigned within a division? It was part of U.S. Uh, United States Army Vietnam or USERV. Um, it's uh, closely associated with MACV, which you might have heard of. That's a lot more popular. But USERV is was what uh, the the parent unit or um, organization that we belong to. I believe we were also part of the 525th military intelligence group, but I never saw anybody from that group that I know of. Gotcha. We, we worked with um, uh, local special forces. I believe it was a B team in um, Benoit. Our working operations uh, area was a, on an, um, an army of Vietnam, Arvin, army of Vietnam, base, which was adjacent to the Benoit Air Base. It was one of the largest air bases probably in the world. Uh, there were a lot of, um, that's where a lot of the uh, um, Agent Orange planes were taking off from, um, or troops were coming out. It was an Air Force base, U.S. Air Force base. It was huge, absolutely huge, um, probably bigger than uh, JFK and San Francisco airport combined. It was really huge. 
Wow. Um, we occasionally see a U-2 spy plane take off and head for a cloud. They just go straight up. It's kind of pretty to watch. Um, we were, our perimeter was mostly protected there on that part. That's where we worked out of. There was a heliport there for us. There was a Vietnamese, uh, the Vietnamese compound that we were on had a small POW camp. Um, it had a Vietnamese, small Vietnamese hospital, and it was the Vietnamese headquarters for three quarter, three corps, um, or a headquarters of sorts, because I know that they were also in Saigon, but there was a headquarters there. And a lot of times, uh, high officers in the Vietnamese army or Vietnamese military would fly in and out. And also um, Air America, uh, which was part of a, a CIA subsidiary of some sort, we would see it say Air America on the helicopter and come and go. Um, so there was a lot of that. We also had, there was an Air Force intelligence group with us uh, nearby. And I can't remember who else, special forces. They were nearby. So, so tell us about your day-to-day -day activities. How would how would a typical day um, play out, and what was your uh, what were your duties during the day? So, my day, uh, let's say a, a typical day would be um, I preferred to volunteer for night. We were worked twelve hours a day. That was pretty much we had shift work, twelve hours on, twelve hours off, and I immediately learned to try to work the 12 hour night, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, shift because that's when we, we were attacked a lot at night. And so rather than be awakened, I'd rather be awake. And so I got on a night, you know, night shift as much as I possibly could. And um, we would, so it, when we would be sleeping, we would stay at our headquarters, which was over by the river that I described earlier. And then someone would take us one of the guys would drive a um, three quarter ton or a two two and a half ton truck and we'd all pile in that we're working the next shift it would, would go someplace let's say a um, a chow hall if we could a mac v had a chow hall we were allowed to use that and then we would go to our operations area at the arvin headquarters and and then we would spend 12 hours basically there um developing photographs working with the intelligence um um personnel um, working out what what we need to prepare for them uh, we would also uh, sometimes there's some of us who would go uh, we would be asked to go fly in a helicopter or a small plane because they wanted somebody to take pictures different than what were being sent to us by the Air Force they might want close-ups or um, to circle a certain area because they saw something in some of the other imagery that was sent to us by the Air Force that we printed up um, and they needed to get a, a detailed analysis. So uh, there was a heliport right there. So we would just walk over to the heliport and, and take off, or we would drive in our Jeep or a truck over into the Air Force base to take a fixed wing flight. What kind of aircrafts were you uh, working on? It was a, uh, um, they called it a beaver single engine prop um, or Hollibird, Hollibird, I think it was a Canadian made plane. Um, and there was, um, and then there were the helicopters you see all the time in Vietnam war movies and mm -hmm. pictures. The, uh, but most of the time, uh, the guys I was, I was with were, we were in what was called a reproduction area or repro section. And we were working with, the photographs that were taken either by somebody else or our guys and we would be developing photographs making prints working with the image interpreters and they would tell us what they wanted to see better and really learned on the job how to develop black and white was what we worked with um and be able to sometimes work magic in some areas where they couldn't see because it was too much shadow from a cloud whatever and they needed to work that out so it was almost like an artist trying to create, um, allow them to be able to see the image, imagery. I mean, in today's world, it's a little quicker with uh, digital. Because oh, yeah. it's, it's also like if somebody, does, if there, uh, there's a plane taking pictures digitally, sending them down to a base, um, you could 
say, oh, that wasn't good. Go back again, you know, yeah. click, 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 you know, and in, in less than whenever there'll be an action that would take place immediately. That's today. But back then it would take quite a while because then the imagery would have to be analyzed and, the Im and then uh, a report is made by somebody and they would send it off to wherever, uh, like an infantry unit or whoever requested it. And then they ask, they'd ask questions and maybe they want more photographs. So it, it's a slow, it was a slow process because everybody could be gone. Well, the enemy could have gone by the time they got what they wanted to look for. Yeah, so that's, that's, what was, that's my next question is, you know, how, how often is it actionable, especially when it comes to troop movement? You know, if were you ever capturing actual troop movements or is it mostly structures that you guys were interested in? A, a lot of times it was structures from what I understand that the guys were looking at because the um, imagery, the imagery was taken in the daytime. And so they would be hiding. And so what they would see is what moved, what's different in that same spot. Yeah. And, and so they would know, well, all those trees seem to have disappeared and moved, you know, about a few miles west or east or something like that. So there, there, there was that kind of thing that, but those with the analysts would be doing all of that. So that's why they would want to have pictures taken all the time, all the time. Um, other than that, the other part was learning how to uh, handle or understand the sounds of incoming versus outgoing rounds. Uh, and uh, that was like somebody yell outgoing when I first got there and I was like, what the hell does that mean? You know, so so we had to learn what that loud sound was. Well, there was a 155 howitzer uh, by the Arvins about uh, less than 100 yards from us. So it got pretty loud uh, sometimes at night when they were firing or firing back, there'll be a typical night might have. Uh, you, you, you could see in the distance at night explosions or tracers going, or you might see um, cobras firing and you'd see a stream from the sky, a stream of fire uh, down in a certain area. And then you'd see an explosion of some sort. Sometimes it would be like sitting out from, we're far away from whatever was going on, but it was actually maybe just a couple of miles. And so what we would have to be careful of is when rocket attacks would start and know where, how to get to our bunkers, because uh, that's about all we could do. We were a distance enough from the perimeter to not be in immediate danger for a uh, ground attack, but, and the, um, and there was a lot of concertina wire, landmines, uh, et cetera, in between the, the, the fence and, and, and guard towers and our actual operations area. So we were well protected, but sometimes that wasn't good enough because a, a sapper or somebody would be caught in the field or we'd see the explosion in a, a, a kind of no man's land area. Yeah. Um, and then in the daytime, somebody would go and clean up the mess. But the uh, what was pretty regular at some point uh, were like clockwork. Um, rocket attacks, rocket and mortar attacks. Um, and then if there was a ground attack afterwards, there'd be a bazillion parachute flares coming down. So then we knew who, somebody might be close. We'd have to take position, but directly, we were never directly uh, uh, responsible or stuck in a situation where we were um, defending ourselves. We were fortunate to have uh, Vietnamese infantry, army, U.S. Army infantry, um, the or uh, military police of both U.S. Air Force or Arvin military police, um, but we'd have to be prepared. We'd be lock, lock and load, and be ready, and take a position uh, if 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 uh, if needed. If needed. So we had, uh, I think, two two sizable bunkers. It was a small unit. I think the whole detachment at peak time was maybe 90 men. We had all men, um, not like today. So it, it was different then. We'd hardly, that's another interesting thing, hardly ever see an American woman unless we went to a, a medical facility and we would see uh, medical personnel uh, or when you'd, 
we weren't far from Long Bin where there was a hospital. I had to go there when I was sick once. For, and, and that's a whole other story around Christmas time. <laughs> so that was probably one of my favorite, most favorite Christmases ever. Um, the, uh, we would see also US, USO workers uh, or um, donut dollies. I, I'd see them. Donut dollies? I, yeah, they call them donut dollies with the, uh, there were women mostly. I don't remember ever seeing a man. They were, there were USO workers who would, uh, I think in World War II, they got the name Donut Dolly because they would give donuts out. Oh, but, uh, never heard uh, of that. Uh, yeah, there's a, you might be able to find Donut Dollies. I think there's a film that was recently made, a historical film or uh, historical information film about Donut Dollies. Huh. Worth looking into. Um, we, uh, I went there once, I went to Long Bend once to make a phone call, to call home. And to call home, it was through a ham radio. So we would call home. We'd actually wind up getting connected to a ham radio from Long Bin to, I think it was relayed in Hawaii and then relayed to San Francisco. And then from there, it would go to a regular phone. So at that point, they would call home. Well, my little sister answered the phone and I had to give her instructions that every time you finish your sentence, say over. And so the ham radio operators would know what to do. It was a very strange, get mom, <laughs> get mom, over. And my sister had to figure that out and say, get mom. So that was, that was, I wish I had a recording of that. It was probably one of the funniest things in the world, but. Is that the um, Mars system? Yeah. yeah, it was a little frustrating for me <laughs> and for them because they didn't know what was going on and I couldn't send them a letter and explain what we were going to do. It's just that I might be able to call. So that was that was that was interesting. So that that was that was, that was a USO facility of some sort at Long Bin, which was a huge military post. You see any good acts? Do you see any good USO? Oh, I did Bob, go to Bob a, the Bob Hope show. Awesome. When, yeah, it was. Um, a few weeks before Christmas, I got to see, uh, th that was interesting because we were asked at the last second, anybody want to go to Long Bend to the Bob Hope show? And I I had just gotten off a shift. So I said, yeah, <laughs> and um, grabbed some chow real quick and, and then changed and went on the truck and they took us and we had to, somebody had to stay and it wasn't me, stay on the truck with all of our weapons because then we would, go into the um, this big sort of amphitheater that was built in Long Bend. And it was full when I got there. So they said, you can't come in. So I went, a couple of my buddies and I walked all the way around. It was a, a chain link fence and we found a spot and we pulled the fence back and low crawled underneath <laughs> it. I ripped my shirt, scratched my back, got in. So I was way in the back, but I got to see, uh, Bob Hope, Ann Margaret, the gold diggers. It was just a nice way to suddenly feel like I'm at home. They'd sing Christmas carols and things like that. So when, course, Ann, when Ann Margaret gets up in front of thousands of GIs, what's that sound like? Uh, it was just, we were gawking. You know, it's just like, oh my gosh, a yeah. real person that I, I've seen in the movies or on TV and they're wearing their go-go boots and mini skirts. And that was the style at the time and singing. It, it was more of the feeling that I had, I know of, okay, I can't wait to get back home, you know, or I look forward to doing what I have to do and then it'll be time to go. Uh, and that's what I have to look forward to is like good old fashioned American stuff. It was just, because it was just so absent from my head it was just my imagination to remember back home but it was, was christmas time which was uh, which is memorable to me you know as a child and growing up family stuff you mentioned the mail um was mail reliable or and if so how long would it take for you to get a letter you know back and forth from the united states well, it would take quite a while. It would, it would take probably about a week or so, I think, for them to get my mail and then this pretty much the same coming back. 
So it, it takes a long time for some kind of communication to take place. Uh, it was free, where you put a postage stamp, you just write the word free. Um, I, I, I would, uh, but I wrote, uh, I sent postcards and some letters. And what, what I did was whenever something really nasty happened that I knew about in my, in my general vicinity on Benoit Air Base, when we get attacked, I would send the postcard. Oh, having a good time, you got a sunburn, you know, something silly, uh, just to let them know I'm okay uh, without talking about the war. I really didn't talk about the war at home, mm -hmm. to home. I just asked them what's going on and, and I would just talk about how hot or humid it is. And I really didn't tell them about what I saw when I'd get out of one secure area and then we would go to the next area, what I saw on the ground, um, especially after a, a major local attack. And, you know, we would see bodies lined up on the road and lime, I think they put lime on the bodies and they were swollen and all. So it was, a, there was a lot of, there were a lot of um, things I just didn't talk about, actually didn't talk about for a long time, years. Um. Re recreation, uh, you mentioned USO, um, in the little downtime you had, what else did you have available to you? You guys have like a, like a local bar, like you could belly up, get a beer or movies. Well, it, yeah. And uh, I think about once a week, a movie would come in. I guess if you've seen the mash movie, mash television show, you'd see movie night. It was something similar to that. The big reel, they'd have to put the reel on thread it through the projector, play the projector. If it's a two reel movie, we have to wait until the other one's put on, you know? So uh, I do remember that. I don't, I, I don't remember too many of those because I work night shift most of the time. I am um, the um, one other recreational activity, which was totally off the wall. We, somebody had um, acquired a boat and an engine and somebody else had acquired, I don't know how, water skis. <laughs> so we were on the Dong Nai River. And one day, because I was off in the day, they said, we need somebody to ride shotgun. We're going water skiing. I said, I'll do it. I said, wait a minute, what do you want me to do? And, 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 and they'd say, you know, so uh, I, I, was, I had a, a 30 caliber, I think it was a Springfield automatic. And a couple of banana clips and I'd sit in there and I was riding shotgun while other guys were skiing and it was a really slow boat. So it'd take quite a while to build up enough speed for the guy to stand up who was water skiing. And eventually I said, I want to learn how to do that. So I learned how to water ski in Vietnam. That's funny. But riding shotgun, the, the, the river was just so, uh, was, was pretty wide. So whoever was steering the boat would know not to go more than maybe halfway across the width because the other side was um, danger, danger land because you'd see jungle, but you can't see who's there. No, we never had pot shots and we never experienced that one in the daytime, but at night you'd see little flashes coming from across the river. So we knew not to go too far because they probably had small arms and they wouldn't want to try to shoot at a water skier. It's just like, unless they were playing uh, something like you would see in a carnival. So, what was uh, the name of the river, Phil? The Dong Nai, D-O-N-G-N-A-I. That's great. <laughs> um, so when you think about your time in, in country, uh, what particular incidents stand out in your mind, whether they be uh, frightening, um, funny, or just plain memorable? When you think about your time in Vietnam, does anything stand out? Well, sometimes it'd be watching a, a firefight from a distance. Um, or or another thing uh, that stands out is when an ammo dump got hit by a mortar or rocket attack, and it would be fire in the distance we'd see it but we'd see explosions go on for a long time and come shooting out that's that's one thing what watching 
uh, these, uh, I think we call spooky um, airplanes that were fixed with all kinds of machine guns. And we'd see that and it looked like it, and at night we would see that, uh, it looked like it would be raining fire. And we'd just say, we don't have to worry about that area. Whatever was there is no longer. Um, that's memorable. I could see that quickly. Um, and the, the sound of a um, B-52 strike, the sounds of a v, B, the ground starts trembling. You'd feel the ground tremble. Any windows we had were taped up because they could get blown out from the concussion pressure. I don't know how far away they were, but they were far enough. They were close enough or far enough away that we could see the smoke. We could see the results of a napalm being dropped um, day or night. You see the, the smoke from the after effects. Uh, certainly, like I live in New York City in Manhattan and we take I take the subway. There are many times when I'm in the subway and the subway, I don't know if you've ever been in New York City in a subway, but sometimes there's this deep roaring sound uh, of tr and trembling that the ground shakes when uh, several trains are passing at the same time underground. And you could feel that when you're underground. And it goes right back to a, B a B-52 strike, comes right back to my head, you know, so. Um, but I know that, okay, this is a good sound. It's just a subway. So there are, there are, um, different kinds of triggers that that go off um but it's a memory kind of thing i don't go into a fit of depression or something like that it's just like oh that's what that that's what that uh, that's what that reminds me or i'll tell my wife that's what it sounds like when a b-52 strike is nearby and she just look at me like oh, okay phil um other other memories um the guys were great we had a very mixed uh group of of men that work together sometimes we we when, when we found out that there were in um there were, we were getting prepared before thanksgiving we got prepared because we knew that there was going to be some sort of an attack and it would probably take place is what we were told uh at an american holiday when because we would be relaxed maybe we'd have a beer or something like that um so we would we were rebuilding and uh, old bunkers, filling sandbags, and everybody had to do it. Everybody, all enlisted men anyway, were no matter what, how many stripes you had, would be filling sandbags, refilling and dumping the old ones because they were rotting away. And I remember while I was there, we kind of transitioned from the uh, um, old fashioned uh, bags that looked like potato sacks small potato sacks and, and it was a, uh, a natural fiber and they would break down and then sand would start falling out that we, we got these plastic type bags about the same size like a small pillow and we'd fill those and then restack them and somebody would be in charge of stacking them properly so that we have a place to duck into um other another thing that was really interesting, like we were in a, a walled in area on one side with uh, with uh, on the top of the wall, what was already there by the Vietnamese, whoever had lived there before us or worked there, uh, there were glass, it looked like, let's say, Coca-Cola bottles were put in. And then after the cement took uh, hardened, they'd break it all off. So the top was razor sharp glass. And then Americans, when we got there, uh, not I, I didn't get there when we first moved into it. I was there after a year or so after our unit moved in. They put up uh, fences, netting over so that anybody, if anybody threw anything like a grenade, it would probably get caught up there and or roll down. Um, and, and concertina, lots of concertina wire. So that was kind of a strange way. You kind of closed in. You have this closed in feeling on one side on the other side was the river oh we had a stone we had a uh concrete wall there with barbed wire and all but you can that was the that's where we had our guard tower on that end because that was a, a vulnerable spot for us and in the front we had guards opening and closing these sheet metal sort of or steel gates whenever one of our vehicles would come in the gates would be opened and then closed and every once in a while when the gates would open, I'd see these kids come by. And that was like, all of a sudden, kids, 
selling fruit, fruit drinks to the local folks, or they would, uh, there's this one little boy, he'd wear this pajama type thing. I'd see him a lot of times. He'd walk by and he'd start making faces at me and, and I'd make faces back and we became distant buddies, never communicated because I didn't speak Vietnamese, um, but we, we would, that would be it. That's our hello. And, and the little girls, the little girls were really cute. They wanted me to buy their fruit drink, but I didn't want it. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, another real, um, and I've, I've written about this, was, was when uh, the, the vehicles had running boards, like an old fashioned car, uh, running boards. So a, a person could actually stand on the outside of the vehicle right by the door and hold onto the uh, side view mirror. Well, when we got stuck in traffic, sometimes kids would hop on and try to sell us cigarettes of some sort. Uh, but we also learned that, or the guys learned before I even got there, to not allow the kids on the on the vehicle. Get them off there. You do anything you can to get the kids off there because they may throw a grenade in or a satchel. So that was a real creepy thing to learn that it was okay when a kid came up, jumped on to open the door and knock them off. It's just an awful, awful feeling. Here's a kid that looks like there might be nine years old, 10 years old, that they are, they are a threat. They were a threat to us. There were lots of things happening in the bigger urban areas like Saigon where uh, grenades were put into, tossed into, um, let's say the gas tank or something like that or just tossed at, at, you know, probably read or seen movies with that kind of thing happening. So we were always vigilant, always vigilant. So that's something that I had to get over with when I came back to the States. You, you mentioned that you were in Saigon for a hot minute on the way in. Did you get any more time? Did you get any, spend any more time in Saigon? No, I really didn't want to. I had opportunities of, let's say, to pick up supplies. Say, hey, we need somebody to help pick up supplies. You want to go? And I, I'd say, no, I really don't want to. I, I did, I didn't feel safe. I mean, I live in a big city now, but uh, that big city, it, it was just too scary for me. I like, I, I didn't feel like I'd be able to protect myself because you'd be, you're vulnerable when you're just in a jeep going by. I mean, we were. That when we were driving from headquarters company to take me to my duty station in Benoit, there, there was firing going on on the road on the way and guys were educating me because I, I still hadn't been issued a weapon yet. So I, I, I just felt really vulnerable and I didn't forget that. The only other time I went to Saigon was when I went to uh, Tansanut for r and &R. I go flow flew out of Tansanut. So I had gone in and out. I just didn't want to hang around there if I didn't have to. Yeah. There were there were there were a lot of great things, a lot of great guys that I I made friends with. The trouble was I didn't get to communicate with many of them until more recently when these old guys started to retire and figure out how to use a computer and look us up, look each other up and there's another story completely about how I was eventually contacted and I'm part of a, an association of uh, um, first military intelligence battalion um, veterans association. And we, it's like a group on Facebook or something like that. Yeah, we, we, we started an organization. We did have, um, we do have a Facebook. It's private to our organization. And um, before, Facebook was really popular. I guess it was uh, emails. We, we were all learning to use emails. And, and uh, so we were connecting that way. And we were communicating with one another. Now we're talking about around 2006 or yeah, 2006. And so once we started communicating, if anybody had somebody else's name and knew where they were, another guy was really good at, they, he'd find an old set of orders. Anybody have orders? Photocopy your orders. Send me your orders and I'll look. And so there's a way with social security numbers to try to figure out where the person lives and if they still live in the same area. And then another guy was researching 
um, cemeteries. Uh, another guy was re uh, researching just addresses if they could figure it out. A few of us did have other guys' addresses. I there were about two three guys that I communicated with Christmas cards and whatever. But um, uh, uh, eventually, people moved and then that stopped. So yeah. But yeah. We, we communicate a lot more now uh, through Facebook. We put something up, memories of those days back back in the 60s. Very cool. So um, you guys had one year tours. Is that is that accurate? Yes. yes. And that, that, that was, they were pretty, pretty good about um, honoring that? Yeah. As a matter of fact, if, if we wanted to at the time, there were a person getting early out if they had less than, I think, three months, I think it was, or something like that, uh, left in the military, some guys would extend for a month and then they'd have enough time, uh, so little time left that they wouldn't get reassigned stateside, they would be sent home. They would, yeah. um, ETS, I guess it was called, uh, uh, back home. I had, I had time left. So I went to, I was stationed in Fort Bragg after that. I went to a uh, PSYOPs unit. Before, before we get into that, I want to yeah. talk about your homecoming, if you don't mind. So um, It was kind of quiet. My homecoming was quiet. My family, personal family, welcomed you know, the sign on the door. Um, but being home, I learned quickly that I wasn't welcomed. Uh, that was really tough. Because I was proud of my uniform, and I'd wear my uniform to go visit old friends from high school or whatever. And um, uh, being spit upon is something that really did happen. So uh, that was really weird. One nice thing is a bus driver just put his hand over the little coin thing where you to pay to get on a bus. He says, "No, thank you," and and he he covered it up. He says, you "Just get on. Just take it easy. You know, thank you." Uh, that was the only time I had probably ever heard "thank you." Um, some of my relatives just started asking me, like, did you really burn down villages with civilians in it? And, you know, so I did get a lot of odd questions because that's all they knew what hit the news. Me Lai was, um, in the news a lot when I got, by the time I got home, because uh, it happened way before. Um, and I really didn't know too much about it. I, I just said, you know, I, I don't know anything about it, but I know, well, I know our guys were trying to protect themselves, but if they did something wrong, they should certainly be punished. So I didn't know too much about it. I know a lot about it now. I read a lot more about it. Yeah. Understand a, a lot more. Maybe don't understand a lot too. So, so um, you have your homecoming, then you go out, you're off to brag. And what, what kind of unit were you assigned to? The I, I was assigned to a PSYOPs unit where they print up materials. And I just thought it was kind of crazy. It was an airborne unit, but it was next to a special forces unit. And um, a reenlistment officer came to me. I didn't reenlist, but he said, uh, you know, have you thought about staying in? I said, I did think about staying in. I thought that, in fact, joining the military would be in. Uh, a, a way to learn a career field and, and maybe even a career because uh, I knew you could retire after 20 years or 30 years or whatever. And so um, I said, I, I, I'm interested in special forces. So he let me sign up for it. I took tests. I got approved. They had, they, and I got sent to special welfare school, which is right next door to my unit that I was in and uh Special Warfare School sent me to Benning for jump school. So I went to jump school and I came back from jump school. I started um, Special Forces training and went to Camp McCall. It was a 30 day field training, uh, learning basics of Special Forces. I came back and I was going through communication school, had just started learning Morse code and um, Kent State happened. And then I just started asking a lot of questions like what's going on, what's going on? I don't understand why are our own troops shooting our own civilians? You know, is it that bad? Can't, isn't there another way? And uh, with all that questioning and support from my buddies, they said, well, maybe you should just take a break because I was thinking of becoming a, a, a full fledged Green Beret. I had to, I, I had gotten the Green Beret, but then I had to give it back because I resigned from Special Forces um, training and then um, I had a short time left. So then I was, um, I got an early discharge. I got discharged 
uh, June 19th instead of waiting until August 14th. So I got a, a, a slight early out. And um, I always thought about, well, what if I would have finished the training? What if I would have stayed in? I really did feel like those, I had worked with some special forces troops while I was in Vietnam and I chatted with some of them. They're really bright guys and they were well-trained and I, I admired what they were able to do. And so when I went through the, the testing alone was extremely hard. It's just the mental test. I was put in a room with a tape recorder and I had to answer questions and, and I couldn't rewind it or anything. I just had to answer questions. And then there was physical test, uh, had to of course be jump qualified by then. Um, and then the actual 30 days out in the field, we jumped in to Camp McCall. And, uh, and uh, that was, it was just a great experience with a bunch of really intelligent, healthy, uh, guys, there was everybody, uh, the guys I was with were from E7 on down to specialists. And um, I did admire that and I learned a lot, but I just chose that I wasn't going to stay in. Yeah. And I went after I got out, I went to college. So. Gotcha. So, um, Phil, I'm going to do something a little bit different. And I, I didn't prepare you for this. I apologize. And if you're not comfortable talking about it, let me know. But we also interview um, witnesses and survivors from 9 11. And you, you you mentioned that you're you're from New York City. Do you, do you mind telling me uh, where you were when you heard about the attacks? And yeah, I'll, t I'll tell you. Um, um, I'll I'll go from when I first realized something unusual was going on. I I I, I work in uh, Lower Manhattan, not that not as far south in Manhattan as the World Trade Center. About I'd say maybe eight miles north of that. And uh, I was coming out of the subway. And I'm walking out of the subway and it was uh, work was is about a block and a half. My uh, I worked at a college and um, I, when I came out of the subway, I saw all these cars stopped. And I what, what happened A traffic accident as I come up the steps, I see more and more and more and I see car doors open taxi cab jar doors open and, and people looking south um, the, the, the road is a an uptown road so why is everybody turned around looking south and then i i so i'm looking at eye level and then i'm looking at the way they're looking and i look up and then i see the twin towers in the distance i always saw them when i come out of the subway and out of the top of one i'd see this little bit of black smoke coming out it's like well that's crazy i wonder what happened you know that i had heard about airplanes flying low small i didn't I, I couldn't imagine what had really happened, but I, I knew something that maybe maybe a small plane crashed into it. I go into work and as I walk in the door, uh, a colleague of mine had an office on the lobby level and he says, Phil, come over here, watch this. I said, oh yeah, I, I just saw that from outside. And then when, while we were watching, I was watching, he had a news station on, I saw the other plane come in. And I said, uh-oh, and with, a few four letter words, I said, this is not an accident. And then I ran up to my office, it was like seventh floor, I just took the stairs. It was just kind of a, the elevators weren't down there. So I just took the stairs, went running up, went onto my floor. And I said, anybody know what's going on, put the radio on, whatever, whatever. And then uh, it's a college. So there was a lot of students coming by some of them were saying my father works down in World Trade Center and they were screaming, they was crying. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happened. Um, uh, I, I get a phone call from a four, former student's grandmother and, and uh, he, she raised him. So um, and his name, Michael Noeth. And so his grandmother calls me and says, Phil, you know, Michael's working down t in, in Washington. I said, yeah, yeah. Well, he, he, he won't answer his phone. He won't answer his phone. I said, well, maybe he's at work. And, and she said, well, I, I have the phone number for his office and he's not answering his phone. So I said, well, I'll try sending him an email. So I sent him an email, Michael, your grandmother wants to talk to you. Why don't you, da, da, da. so then I find out I, I'm talking to my brother who worked in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, I, I, I called him and said, how's it going? I heard that there was some kind of something that, going on in Washington. He said, 
yeah, the Pentagon was hit by an airplane crashed into the airport. I said, uh oh. Um, and then I, f I found out that Michael. Excuse me. Um, Michael Noweth, he was a sailor and he was an art student when he was at the college of where I worked, Fashion Institute of Technology. He was an illustration major and uh, he was a, a Navy, um, he wasn't a Navy illustrator, he was a draftsman. And he had been doing drawings and paintings in the Pentagon of admirals. He had been preparing a series of them that they were gonna hang in the, in the uh, Pentagon. And I found out that the area uh, later, it was much later, the area that he, the plane hit, he was in it. Uh, in the World Trade Center, another former student was working at the restaurant. Windows. <laughs> windows of the world and um she was the woman who was calling the police and wanting to have a helicopter land because the windows of the world was up on the top floor and uh she was uh well the whole uh, the, the, oh, they couldn't go down and uh, she she was lost in in the world trade center and then a friend of mine uh was uh A fireman. Excuse me. Trying to hold my composure so I can continue talking, but uh, take your time. That was um, a tough time. Uh, I remember that I, um, my wife calling me. She was working from home. Um, and she called me and she was, uh, she said that my sister had called her and said, have you put the television on? My sister, my wife doesn't watch television a whole lot, neither do I. And then she put the television on and found out the World Trade Center had been hit. My, my wife didn't even know. And it was like around maybe 930 by then. And so then my wife called me at work and she said, you better come home. So I did. And when I went to go home, I uh, left my office and um the subways were all not working none of the subways were working so um i'm a runner i i ran home um about uh well if i worked on west 27th street and i live on west 72nd street so it was straight uptown on the way of uh, uh one of my colleagues was on the way to work and i said uh don't worry about going to work they're sending people home and don't go in the subway because we can't get in the subway and there might be a bomb in the subway. So there's all these things going on. Uh, I just wanted to be home with my wife at that point. Um, and I just knew something that was really bizarre. So that was a pretty so rough moment. How far did you run home? Uh, from West 27th Street to West 72nd Street. Wow. Something 40, 50 bucks. So, you know, obviously the, the attacks changed America and the world for that matter, but I can only imagine being a resident in New York City. How, how did how did those attacks change, change the entire culture and day-to-day and -day life in New York City? Well, they um, immediately, uh, National Guard had come in and we saw National Guard and I never saw a convoy in Manhattan before in my life. Um, everyone, everyone was really friendly and kind to one another. It was so not New York. Um, New Yorkers tend to be to themselves. Uh, and, and, and unless you know the people or a pocket of people where you live or friends from a group, but New Yorkers just kind of go about their business. So everybody became everybody. I really, I'm saying making it a broad statement, but it was unusual otherwise. Everybody was friendly. Everybody was trying to uh, be supportive of one another. If they saw something, they would say something to each other. Um, it was um, 
a, a very different moment the, the first few weeks, especially. Uh, there were all kinds of ceremonies going on. There were, um, the fire burnt. It was uh, September 11th. It was not until around December, January when the smell went away, because when the wind would blow north, it smelled like burnt plastic, that kind of a odor, dust. Um, the um, government provided air filters for our apartments mm. if we wanted one, because uh, the air was like, we, we would see the dust form on our windows from the ashes that would fly by. And, and sometimes you look at the ashes and you say, is that a, a piece of technical equipment, piece of a building or a person? You know, it was just... I have friends who were working in lower Manhattan and they saw the people jumping out. So they, their, their recollection is of raining people. Um, uh, another friend of mine, a uh, Vietnam veteran, um, was operating uh, one of the a ferry boat, small ferry boat. It's called a water taxi uh, along the Hudson. And he was ferrying people out of southern southern part of Manhattan to New Jersey just to get people out. They couldn't, they, you, the, the bridges were closed. Um, we, were, we were starting to get sealed in. So uh, if bad guys were coming from another, another method and there were extremely high police presence or, or military police. And from then on, there have been military police in the railroad stations and depending on the level of alert uh we would see of course at uh, airports oh here's a, an unusual moment was that air traffic had stopped it was the quietest in new york for a lot of reasons because vehicles weren't going any place um similar to some strange parts of the pandemic where everything stopped life stopped um, and at night, fighter jets would be flying overhead, and it scared the heck out of my wife. Uh, she grabbed me, and I said, it's okay, it's the good guys, it's the good guys. Because <clears throat> that was a familiar sound from Vietnam. It's when, when uh, fighter jets would come by, and then you'd hear explosions. It's like, okay, they got rid of whoever was getting close. So there's a lot of that. Um, a lot of camaraderie, uh, friends of ours, uh, I'm a runner. Um, my wife's a runner, that's how we met. Um, we had friends over our, in our apartment and we kind of self-helped. We let each other talk about it and how we're gonna deal with this from now on. Um, so it was a, a big change, a big, a big, big, big change. And, and a lot of tragedy, it was really sad really sad. Uh, a lot of funerals for firemen uh, and policemen, police officers and fire fighters. Uh, it was just constant, constant. And the fire departments near us, if you walk past one, you'll see a monument dedicated to the firefighters lost on 9-11. Or police, you'll see a plaque in front of the police station. Um, a big change in society from there on. And then the next part that got really awkward was uh, a, a major sense of insecurity about people, what they look like. Do I trust this person because their skin is a little darker or they wear a turban and they're driving a taxi? So is that a bad guy? No, it's not a bad guy. This is a guy who's lost family too because they were working downtown maybe or something like that. So there's, there's a lot of stories of pe from people I know and friends. So there was, um, I, 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 um, I would say that that was a, a major, major change, of course, than the rest of the world, the Middle East wars from then on um, until Afghanistan stopped. So uh, yeah, it was, it definitely hit hit home. My family too, making phone calls, trying to find out what was going on. How am I? Are you okay? Are you safe? Yeah. Well, sorry to spring that on you, and thank you for sharing that. I, you know, it's we've interviewed some nine eleven survivors, um, but it's 
it's always interesting to hear how it impacts everybody, especially those who are like you, who are very close, close by to the attacks themselves. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I got uh, two more questions and then we can wrap it up. Okay. Um, so back, back to military, um, you know, you, you spent a number of years in the military and in a, in a, in a, in a particularly um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in Vietnam and if you had, you mentioned that you're, you were involved in education. Are you still involved? In- I, I retired as a professor at Fashion Institute of Technology as part oh. of the State University of New York. I, I taught team building. So one of the things I wanted to do after I got out of the military was try to do something to help people understand each other so they don't have to fight either fisticuffs yeah. or war, try to communicate. And right. so I... Um, I became a counselor and uh, I taught team building and had workshops and I did that for 40 years. And oh, wow. So, so if you had a, a student of yours who's saying, Hey, you know, I, I, I understand you're a veteran. Uh, I'm thinking about enlisting or becoming commissioned in the United States army. What advice would you give them on how to be successful once you're in the military? Uh, well, it was like the, the one fellow who died in the Pentagon. He's somebody uh, who talked to me before he joined. I would say something similar. I'd say, well, what is it you like to do? The military has so many career fields. It's not just go out and shoot somebody. It's it's like you see in in a war movie. It's what makes it possible for the warriors to be able to fight. There's a lot of support. And today there's so much technology involved in in the military. So if you like, what is it you like to do? And, And so I would talk to them about what they like to do. And then I'd also talk to them about understanding how military has a a basic sense about the whole thing is to defend our country and our and our um our precious land and and the people and other places that are that we want to help protect to keep war from happening here so you have to be prepared to defend yourself so how do you feel about firing a gun how do you feel about that how do you feel about taking orders from somebody because they just told you to do it and they said don't think about it just do this so i would talk to them about the basic sense because when i went in it was it was a different kind of motivation because we had a draft and it was just men well whereas now men and women join voluntarily so I, whether it's a male or female person I'm talking to, or I, I, I try to explain to them what they might be able to ask a recruiter so that they can take tests for that specific area or to find out if they have a field and check out all the branches. Don't stop at one. Uh, there are people who don't do that. They want to go into the Marines because dad was in the Marines. You know, So that's fine. Uh, but what I, I wanted somebody who has no background military, except for maybe a, a grandfather, uh, to really do do some homework about it. And that there's a lot of benefits for being in the military. I think it helps people who are having uh, questionable issues about what they're going to do with themselves to stabilize themselves and to be able to learn how they can take care of themselves and other people through the military and that it's it's a, an honorable profession an honorable way to live and i wouldn't um i would always advise somebody i didn't say don't go in i would never say that i would say well find out what it is that you might want to do and that it, you might learn that there's something other than what you've seen in the movies yeah all right here, here's here's the last one it's it's a doozy mm-hmm. um so I, we talked before we were hit the record button about you're going to get a copy of this video and and some um, instructions on how you can submit your story to the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Theoretically, your story will be preserved um, at the Library of Congress for hundreds of years, as long as the United States government still standing, your story will be preserved. If one of your great, 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 great grandkids stumbled upon this video um, 50, 100, 150 years from now, what would you want them to know about your service to your country? I'd want them to know that I served my country and I served it in a war zone for part of my service because I wanted to protect the people who were there to do whatever we could 
to preserve a democratic process in that country like ours. And if there's one thing that you want to do is to try to make sure that we always have this democratic process continuing in our country and in our country, our friends, other other states, other nations around the world, and then be prepared that you may have to do that. And I did that because I wanted to protect our people and I didn't want a form of government to just tell us what we should be doing for the rest of our lives. I wanted other countries. I was stationed in Germany. I was stationed in Vietnam. Those two countries, I was there to help preserve democracy so that the world could be free and we could just go from place to place without a lot of questions and, and feel safe when we go there. So I think that'd be really important for my ancestors to, to, to hear, read, or whatever, learn about why I went and why others should. And maybe one day there'll be other forms of, of national service other than military that would be helpful to our country or other countries. Well said. On behalf of the Americans in Wartime Experience, I thank you for spending the time with us today. And more importantly, thank you for your service to our country and welcome home. Thanks, Phil. I appreciate it. Thanks, Greg.